Hello and welcome to the Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Nathan Cassiotis. I'm a business growth expert where I help business owners grow and scale to create wealth and freedom. Today, I have an awesome guest. His name is Dr. Stephen Morse. And Stephen is the founder and CEO of Unchained Solutions, a Sydney-based consultancy that equips Australian organizations to comply with the Australian Modern Slavery Act 2018. And Stephen has over 25 years of experience in entrepreneurial leadership in the non-for-profit and private sectors, both in Australia and overseas, and is a seasoned public speaker, thought leader, and strategist who brings an engaging and refreshing perspective to the fight against modern slavery and related human rights violations and its impact on supply chains. And Stephen obtained his doctorate in human trafficking intervention through Fuller Theological Seminary, CA in 2016, and it has an MBA in entrepreneurship to the University of Technology, Sydney in 2020. And he currently serves on the advisory board of the Freedom Business Alliance, the Essex Committee of the Australasian Supply Chain Institute, and the Communications Working Group of the Commonwealth 8.7 Network. Welcome, Dr. Stephen Morse, and thank you for being on my show. Ethan, thank you so much. The question that sounded fabulous. Thank you. That was a great introduction. Very welcome, mate. I like to give it with a lot of energy, right? So yeah, I can, a lot uh, of energy. I'm, I'm going to rise to this energy. It's going to, I'm going to rise to it. So. That's it. That's just how, one, one way that I differentiate myself, right? From other podcasts <laughs> out there. So got to keep it interesting and engaging for everybody. So uh, love it, mate. Love to have you. You know, it's going to be great on the show today for everyone watching and listening. So firstly, you're a very successful entrepreneur. So for those people who don't know who you are, uh, please introduce yourself by telling us more about you and your journey. Sure. Uh, my journey, well, I'm a bit of a cat with nine lives. So that's kind of my journey. Uh, I've gone full circle in an, on a number of fronts. So I've been, you know, running my company now for six years. I will be six uh, in January, which is fantastic. I feel like I've sort of crossed that Rubicon, that five-year mark uh, with Unchained Solutions. Uh, you know, it's been really an incredible journey of building a company. Um, probably two things, building a company uh, and then consulting on a very critical issue in, in our world. Uh, the sort of the two have kind of been like a, a sort of second double master's experience um, to, to do both and to do both success. So I'm really pleased uh, what we've been able to achieve um, yeah, since uh, since inception back in 2018. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, working overseas. I was based in Spain uh, for uh, another six years. So six years before this six years, uh, I was working uh, in living in Madrid uh, with my wife. And there we were. That's kind of the backstory to what we're doing now. Uh, I was working, doing my sort of doctoral research, which you mentioned, uh, looking at uh, the issue of human trafficking uh, into, into Spain and Europe. Uh, and that's uh, sort of the background, all that research to understand, uh, you know, the push and pull factors of uh, the sort of socioeconomic dynamics of what's going on and what's happening at both the sort of the the demand side the the grassroots as well as as the as the as, and the supply side so that's kind of the background of my wife in that time she worked in a safe house for women who were coming uh, out of uh uh, sexual exploitation, uh, street work in Madrid. And so we kind of combined all that, all that lived sort of experience, uh, all that research, and, and that led us to then uh, into um, Unchained. Prior to that, uh, I've got a background uh, as a Christian pastor. Um, so I did that for seven years. So it's everything sort of in six and seven year periods for me. Uh, <laughs> so I've done a lot to, to work in communities and build communities and transform uh, uh, in, in a transformative sense and do a lot of teaching and education and pastoring. Uh, and before that, I was in advertising and business. So I kind of started my life in business, went through uh, church and church work, on field work, and now I'm back to the business world. So I'm kind of, uh, you know, I keep on uh, reinventing myself uh, into the space. Uh, but all, all through that time, uh, operating in, in situations of leadership and teaching and education and building upon uh, building and building. And so I'm a kind of a perpetual learner in that sense. Uh, if I'm not learning something, if I'm not being challenged by something, I'm, I'm sort of like, well, I need to be, so let's do something else. You know, let's do another course. Let's, let's learn something new. I'm constantly willing to be challenged and to do better and, and, and reach, yeah, sort of greater, greater degrees of, of excellence in what I'm, what I'm doing. Yeah, love it, mate. Great intro there about the journey. And um, so interesting about the seven years thing, six or seven <laughs> years. That's actually um, with 
children actually growing up as well right a lot of their beliefs and yep. habits, you know in that six seven year period and each going like they change a lot so it's very interesting um that that's happened like, yes i've just continued on that on that direction that, that's right <laughs> people would say that but um they're, they're crucial times you know when, when when we change as humans um growing up so very interesting on that one and then we met um you know at the mba uts um, together as well so great way, you know, to to meet when you're doing, you know, these uh, learnings in, uh, you know, different institutes and communities and, and building relationships. And finally now got you on the show, uh, which is great as well. So, um, yeah, no, it's awesome, mate. Love the, more of that backstory there. So let's get into it now. So firstly, love to hear your thoughts on um, the intersection between, I guess, business and human rights here, right? Um, and why it's important for companies to prioritize this, right? And what they're doing yeah. in their operations. Sure. Well, the whole notion of business and human rights has sort of come down through uh, the international level, uh, through the United Nations. Uh, so there is actually a document called uh, Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, it's quite a, a, an important document and it really kind of targets and speaks to big business, admittedly, um, really calling upon uh, yeah, corporations to start thinking through not just uh, in the terms of their business strategy, you know, how to kind of maximize profits or the bottom line or think just about quality or the, the return on investment or all those kinds of things, but start thinking about the value of actually of people, um, people who are working um, in close proximity, say perhaps within the organization, and there are human rights issues uh, that are internal to an organization. And then sort of from there, reaching out to, to the broader sort of business ecosystem, thinking through uh, who adds, who is actually adding value to your business um, and who's who's supplying to your business. And so that sort of those guiding principles are finding translation in into more hard legislation, uh, such as the Modern Slavery Act, which uh, is a, it was really a piece of legislation which does target uh, business, uh, the business community, as well as government agencies that that procure, procure um, byproducts. Uh, we do have, you know, slavery is is uh, illegal uh, according to the Australian Criminal Code, but we have this additional piece of legislation to um, impress upon companies to take responsibility for things which are kind of outside the legal framework within Australia, such as what's going on, where those goods and services are coming from, and for the Australia that means, by and large, Southeast Asia. Um, so where those products are being made. So companies are being asked to consider the, the human, the human, the social dimension of, uh, of doing business. Internally, that might find expression in issues around gender equality, um, affirmative action, or diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it might have to do more close to home about ind Indigenous procurement, for example, or making sure that, uh, you know, the workplace is safe, both uh, physically safe in terms of workplace health and safety, or the, the social contract is, is safe as well. So people, there's that kind of social psycho safety as well. But then moving up from that um, to thinking through, you know, what are the conditions of workers in the factories that, um, that are making the products that I then import into Australia? Um, so making sure that those processes, those factories are being run well um, and, and having a responsibility for that as well, not just um, what's within my own kind of domain as well. So that kind of, um, that's increasingly becoming important um, as part of a broader uh, ESG or environmental social governance reporting framework. And we're, you know, in, a, in an age where that's increasingly becoming important, uh, as companies not just have to think about its sustainability issues in terms of energy use, um, emissions or waste or, or um, management of waste or water, for example, they need to also start thinking through the social dimensions, uh, which I've mentioned a few already. Uh, and that includes thinking through yeah, what's happening in their supply chains. Um, that's very much important, very much part of, very much a, a key component of the Modern Slavery Act is to actually do due diligence, actually make sure that when you're importing a product in, into Australia, that it's not tainted with issues of forced labour that or extreme forms of child labour, or there's no kind of coercion or um, controls that are slave-like um, in those contexts. Yeah, awesome, man. I love that um, whole view of uh, how it is, uh, which is important, uh, you know, for people to understand. And I'd love to firstly hear just how it's evolved, right, for the last maybe decade or six years that you've been in it um, in terms of the corporate responsibility and now how people are looking at, you know, modern slavery now, um, you know, more, um, you know, lately compared to what it was before. 
Sure. Yeah. Well, the modern slavery act has been in place. Uh, it was enacted in 2018 um, and really came into play in 2019. So we're, we're four years, four to five years down the track. Um, a lot of companies, particularly those who need to report, and they are usually those who are over 100 million in annual consolidated revenue. So we're talking about big business listed companies that are mandated to report. Um, and they are, you know, they've put in place all sorts of governance uh, frameworks, risk management frameworks, policies, education pieces, supplier engagement, mapping of the supply chain, all that kind of work is very foundational. And a lot of companies have been able to do that quickly, depending on the size of the company. And, you know, they've got a risk and compliance department or function. They've got, you know, lawyers, they've got a, a team of people to help them do that. And that, that varies from company to company. Um, so the bigger the company, the more capacity they have for that. The smaller the company, the more they might need to outsource those kind of services. So we have seen a lot of companies have, you know, obviously um, sought to comply with the Modern Slavery Act. We have seen a sort of a, sl a slowing of, of the kind of the, the, the initial kind of excitement and flurry around that. Um, you know, the early years, there was a lot of buzz and a busyness around it. Um, but uh, I think as time has gone on, uh, you know, modern slavery has fallen uh, to sort of play a second or third fiddle to other more pressing um, ESG impact areas. Um, you know, if I was to look at the whole landscape at the moment, I'd say, you know, measuring scope three emissions, that means measuring the emissions of your suppliers is, is a top, is top priority at the moment. Um, that's on the in the E camp, the environmental camp. In the S camp, probably the top issue um, is around in Indigenous affairs, um, and that's sort of in light of the the, the voice um, re referendum, especially in Australia. So that was very much at the forefront. Second to that would probably be issues around diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and we've had a royal commission into, for example, the treatment of people with disabilities recently. On the governance front, um, you've got issues around cyber security, um, anti-money laundering issues. So a lot of sort of financial risk and financial crime issues. And they, you know, they're popping up all the time now as companies are being, you know, um, uh, impacted um, um, in, in negative ways and people as people's data is being stolen. And so we've got issues around privacy. So that all comes under the governance piece. I suppose in that entire landscape then, there's a lot of issues there. So it's a massive beast. And modern slavery is kind of like, well, we've done a bit, we've done some work, but until there's a bit more clout, a bit more, you know, energy from government, um, nothing much is more is going to happen. And that that will come because we've just had a statutory review into the Modern Slavery Act, some recommendations to strengthen the legislation, perhaps provide some, put in some uh, fines for non-compliance, um, lower the threshold for reporting to broaden the number of companies they need to report. Um, put in a greater prescription for what companies should be doing to kind of move them along. But it's not an easy issue to address. Um, and unlike, say, carbon emissions that you can count, you know, um, accounting for modern slavery risk is more qualitative and sort of at times a bit sort of somewhere over there. So there's this kind of cycle, so, so, so psychological distancing. The issue is somewhere over there, maybe in Bangladesh or... And so it's not it's not in my face. And I think sometimes business, you know, we just want we need to deal with the short term, the immediate. What's in my face? What's government asking me for now? What is a tender process ask, asking for me now? And so the important issues they're all important, but it's in terms of priorities, um, it can it can play a second or third fiddle. So that's kind of the landscape. We are though seeing a bit of a shift now that those recommendations from that statutory review have come out. Um, there is, yeah, renewed interest uh, over time and we are getting, I suppose, the interest as a, for me as a smaller kind of consultancy, um, I do speak to, to small business a lot and there is a growing sort of pressure on small business to step up, not that they have to comply with the legislation, but they might need to align with the company that they're working with. They might, they could be in a tender process or with the government and there's a line that says, what have you got in place around modern slavery? And that's the sticky point. So that's where I can come in <laughs> and help small business. Yeah, nice. Awesome, man. That's good to know. And, and just like a little bit more on that, just so that everyone's aware, because I think the big corporates sort of, they're all over this because they know they've got the, you know, the magnifying glasses on them, but for small businesses that may be not aware of what's needed. So what's 
what's the level when you know from either the current act or what's being talked about about what it's there that they have to be like apart from submitting the tender um and and you know showing that you have this that you actually have to you know look at this and and comply so that you don't get fined or you know anything like that well, I mean, for, I think for small businesses, it's about sort of maintaining that license to operate. So, and we've kind of, I think since 2019, we have seen a shift in terms of what's been asked of, of small business who function as suppliers within Australia, within the Australian context. So say back in 2019, 2020, they might need to have a, some sort of policy, a human rights policy or a modern slavery policy, which sort of says, and just basically states what they're against, what they stand for or stand against. And maybe there's some indication that they're going to attend over time, they'll attend some aspects of due diligence. We've seen a shift from that to more, you know, needing to provide training for their staff, um, to have a, a greater, a bigger policy portfolio um, with an ethical sourcing policy, for example. Um, and even most recently, then in just over the last four months, I've had conversations with small business around now they're being asked to map their own suppliers. So you've got the, the corporate client, they're the tier one supplier. Now they're being asked, well, what do you know about the, the companies that you're buying from, which is tier two? Um, so the, the, the pressure is mounting um, on suppliers to, to demonstrate uh, good practice and, and due diligence, not just on issues of human rights and modern slavery, but also around scope uh, emissions because scope through emissions have to do with suppliers. And so therefore there's this kind of um, double doubling up of making sure that you are yeah, demonstrating due diligence on an environmental as well as a social front. And in that too, there may be questions around indigenous procurement um, and diversity, equity and inclusion as well. Yeah, awesome, mate. Love that. And yeah, I'm, I, my, my previous company, which I still obviously do, is in waste management. So I understand um, this space, which is a part of the ESG framework. And um, so it's more about, I guess, what the bigger businesses or anybody is playing is you have to be asking more of the questions and start to move basically all of your suppliers. That's the ideal outcome, right? So that, that to confirm <clears throat> that there's no bot in slavery, where there's slave labor or things like that, right? That's happening down the track. That's right. I mean, it's not right for a company to sort of get you to sign a statutory declaration saying there is no slavery in my supply chain because no one can say that for certainty. Uh, it's about, um, you know, identifying and, and putting in place steps um, and making commitments that even if you don't have something in place today, that you've got a clear action plan, action roadmap that you're going to um, meet certain targets uh, in the next 12 months or the two of the two years and I think that's kind of the direction of ESG is to have you know clear KPIs and and targets uh, to meet um, and that you have a, a, a plan in place to meet those and that requires you know some level of resourcing um, capacity building because um, you know small business doesn't have that necessarily um, you know you're we're in a we're in a I think in, a, in an era of business survival at the moment with rising interest rates, inflation. So there's that whole sort of dynamic of ESG is is rubbing up against you know economic tensions uh, globally around supply chain disruption, interest rates, um, conflict in in different parts of our world um, as well. So this is all I suppose part of the the game at the moment that we're playing. Yeah, nice. And I think the procurement departments, right, are really the key people here because they're the ones that get the suppliers in, right, of where they're getting things from. What are you seeing if there's a bit of a disconnect between maybe like the cheapest price for something, but they don't have the reporting or the, you know, the, the confirmation there to someone that might be a little bit more expensive, but they're getting more confirmation that, yeah, we're doing things the right way. And we're going to give you the right information and everything like that there. What are you seeing that are they, you know, still going down the cheapest route and going, oh, we'll work on that later? Or are they actively going, you know what, we'll, we'll pay a little bit more because we're going to be seen in a better light and working, you know, towards our plan. Yeah, I think you think that's a that's a really good question, and I think um, I think that tension still exists um, because you know whilst there's legislation in Australia, um, there's not legislation everywhere, so it's not a level playing field. Um, there's legislation in Australia. It's there's new legislation being formed in New Zealand. There's lots of legislation in Europe. Um, that's probably the greatest concentration: UK, France, Netherlands, Germany, and then the whole European Union. 
has just uh, announced uh, directives on supply chain due diligence and the environment as well. So that's going to be a massive wave, a big shock to the to the the global system over the next couple of years. But that's different to say what policies might be in place in in Singapore or Malaysia or Vietnam, for example. So um, there is very much um, attention at work there. How do we actually verify risk? Um, how do we change our our procurement? practices so that we're not just going for the bottom line, um, but then we're competing with other companies who don't care um, about, about that as well. Uh, that is, um, I think that is an education piece over the long term to raise the bar, in, you know, universally so that um, everyone is has the same understanding and appreciation of human rights. And that is not the case. So even though we have a, you know, universal declaration of human rights. Um, we have uh, guiding principles that many companies and governments um, subscribe to and UN development, sustainable development goals that that many governments sign up to if there's various degrees of enforcement um, uh, in that. So, uh, so it's not an even la landscape, but having said that, the, the regulations are, are growing um, and I think we're going to see a big shift um, in that because there will be certain pressure points and I think the European Union especially is is going to create a massive pressure point um, that you won't be able to import products into Europe um, and that's going to change the game it's because it's a massive market and I think the United States particularly when it's with its recent amendment to its Customs Act they can't actually import products made from say Xinjiang province in west western part of China that are made by forced labor with Uyghur peoples that's also that also puts pressure um, on on markets. So money talks and uh, and markets talk. So if markets shift, that can also put pressure, even if the regulations aren't there in that local local place. Yeah, love it. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, where it's going in that direction. And I guess embedding these ESG principles into our company's DNA is a popular concept. I know you're you're big on, right? So. If we're looking at it, not just from the perspective we're talking about, but the whole company now, how can we effectively incorporate this so that everybody's involved, you know, on this journey of, of ESG? Yeah, so, yeah, we often think, uh, you know, something environmental might be sort of exceptional um, and we need to think about it being normative, something which is normal. And I think that really comes down to thinking, you know, coming back to the business plan, coming back to the business strategy um, and thinking through how do we how do we operate um, as, a, as an organization, what do we stand for um, is, is a good question. Um, so coming back to those key questions of our why um, and our what and our how uh, and thinking through, you know, what, what do we want to be known for as a company um, and, and therefore how can we then behave better in our, in our local context, in our business ecosystem um, and make some sort of impact. And I think, you know, with the rise of, you know, social traders, for example, and, and B Corp, um, B Corporations and those kind of social um, certifications, there are avenues and ways in which companies can start putting in place, looking at the different business functions, looking at governance, for example, looking at um, the workforce, looking at the environment, looking at their customers, and then put and putting in place certain targets and measures to make sure they have the right policies and procedures in place they don't just sit on a file on a computer, but are actually well socialized and, and integrated in a way that there's a feedback loop so they can be improved as well. So I think the concept of continuous improvement is important. I think having some sort of maturity model in place as well to think, well, this is where we're up to at the moment, and this is where we want to be. And these are, these are the steps that we want to take to reach that level of maturity in, in key business areas. So I think part of the strategy really is to come back to come back to the basics, come back to that, maybe that lean model canvas <laughs> and think through, you know, depending on where you are in your business, but really think through, you know, how do we, um, how do we operate as a business? What do we stand for? Um, where do we want to make an impact um, when it comes to, um, you know, servicing our company so we can actually provide our products and services um, knowing who we're buying from, um, and and look and having a, an ethical sourcing policy, which is a very a, a sort of um, proactive approach, 
to think, well, I want to, I only want to work with businesses that have, that share the same value. So there's a value alignment piece as well. In that, then there's all sorts of education that's involved. Um, and that's where you can get your younger generations involved because there are lots of reports that indicate that Gen, Gen Ys and Gen Zs, this is very much on their heart. They want to work for companies that are actually making impact, that, that are doing the right thing. So they've got the ideas of, and ways in which you can actually start to change the culture within the organization. And then you can build out from there and actually make sure that, yeah, you have the right frameworks in place to actually operate in a responsible way. Yeah, love that. And so, you know, the benefits to my knowledge of what you just said, maybe you can touch a little bit more on is, um, you know, the alignment of other businesses going, hey, we're focusing on this. This is important for us. And then people that are actually wanting to work as well for, for you know, for these companies that are, you know, focusing on that, those ESG elements. That sounds about right. Yeah. It does. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, there's the concept of the employer value proposition. Um, so it's not so, today, it's not so much about the employee value proposition, companies employing people who are going to bring value to them. Companies need to now demonstrate that they have value to the employee. So, <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, employees are looking for, and and uh, and I think Gen Zs, I think are going to shape the way even this even more. They want to work with, with companies that have certain values and operate in a certain way. And that's going to change the way that companies do business. So it's not just about the model, bottom line. Value is not just about quality uh, and price and speed of uh, delivery. Um, there's all the quality is also going to entail uh, the social dynamic um, of how products are being made, not just um, and who may, who's making them, not just um, what is being made and how fast can I get it um, to shelf. Um, so, yeah, so I think the value of that then has on, there's a lot of value for the workforce um, and in terms of staff retention uh, has, has been noted. So, you know, um, having a churn on your, on your team is expensive, right? That's a big cost. So if you can actually energize your team um, and engage them, then that sort of redu that reduces uh, the cost of, of recruitment because it's an expensive exercise. Um, likewise, if you actually have, um, you know, if you're working with other companies and suppliers who are doing the right thing, then you're actually building a more resilient uh, supply chain. And again, you know, when we look at the, if we think of business as part of a bigger ecosystem, then, you know, resilience comes through actually working and being supplied by other organizations that are actually also resilient um, and doing responsible things. So there's nothing over over the long term, there's nothing to be gained from bad practice, from corruption, uh, from, you know, from the mistreatment and, and violations of human rights. Um, you know, as, you know, as the conditions of workers increase in terms of their contracts, in terms of their pay, in terms of the state of the factory they're working in, then we're actually in a better place to actually get better quality products and also to create new markets um, that we can, you know, because we're actually enabling people to actually become a stronger market in themselves. So there's lots of, there's lots of, in terms of the business case, there's a lot to be said for good practice. Um uh, across the board yeah awesome great points there and i think it was yeah the employee value proposition employee value proposition was a great one because um you know especially with the market now where the jobless rates the lowest it's ever been harder to find talent so you've got to have that area there that attracts them as well as you know makes people want to stay there so i love those those points um really awesome too and i guess you mentioned a little bit before but for those people who don't know who they are, what they are I, I know them but the uh the united nations sustainable development goals the sdgs um i know there's 17 of them um we want to explain a little bit more about what that is and then you know how companies can align with some of these right so that it um you know makes a, a bigger difference and showcases you know how they how they're focusing on it yeah, so the SDGs um, were developed um, sort of around about 2015 um, off the back of other goals that we had were the millennial goals. So we had millennial goals from 2000. And so in 15 years, there were, I think back then it was about seven goals. That seven goals has kind of become 17 goals. Um, and there is some criticism around that. It's kind of like we've got 17 goals and some 194 um, target areas, you know, embedded within that that seventeen. So, it's it's quite a labyrinth. It's quite an elaborate <laughs> uh, piece, and I think part of the criticism, and uh, you know, we're kind of halfway through the journey. With the targets are for 
2030. And, you know, some of those targets are baseline, you know, very basic needs around, you know, um, global poverty. So, you know, reducing global poverty, providing universal healthcare, education, um, providing, um, you know, safe drinking water for everybody, enough food for everybody in the world. Um, so that they're kind of the baseline one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then, then you move into issues around gender equality, um, decent workplaces, uh, and then the top levels are around international partnerships and cooperation and all those kinds of things. So worth looking into um, and, you know, governments and big business sort of sign up to these kind of targets. Um, but there's a lot to sign up to and there's a lot to sort of aim for. Um, and part of the dynamic, I think, through that's been noted through the COVID years, um, if we can sort of phrase it like that. I don't really know how to kind of express the COVID period. It's kind of this kind of little epoch now, isn't it? Um, which I know we're not out of fully, but, um, you know, that a lot of that was disrupted. Um, you know, we saw with all the supply chain disruption, borders closed, you know, we, you know, the whole, all the efforts towards, you know, halving global poverty and all those kind of baseline targets were just, you know, either slowed down or they just stopped. And so we're kind of at this kind of critical point now of, you know, are we going to meet those targets? Is it too, is it kind of achievable? Um, and what can, and how, how are we going to achieve that or even just half achieve it <laughs> given the current state of the world at the moment? So that's kind of what the UN goals are. They're not, they're kind of soft, what we call soft laws. Uh, they're more kind of targets, guidance, directives, rather than hard legislation, which is, you know, say the Modern Slavery Act or, um, you know, Environmental um, Act um, in Australia, which is hard law, which is mandated, and you need to comply if you fit this category, for example. So it's kind of, the dynamic is that there are these universal targets that then are translated into hard legislation um, in different ways, and we're seeing that in different parts of the world. Yeah, <laughs> awesome, I love it um, for breaking that down for everyone, and I guess you know, for for the SME businesses, maybe the ones that are like listening to this and they're going, hey, I want to get more involved in ESG, but they haven't started yet. What do you think are some, you know, some ways that might have limited resources, you know, compared to the big guys that they can start to incorporate some of this and showcase this, you know, to get those benefits? Well, you can join my ESG strategy course. <laughs> so that's, that's, uh, <laughs> Um, something I've uh, launched in October. Um, I've got a, a five day five day course. It's five 90 minute sessions in the morning from Monday to Friday, and it will take you through what is ESG and then the, the main concepts and main reporting criteria for each of the uh, impact areas, um, as well as help you to start framing an, a strategy. So I think part of that and part of the experience of those who did that course was around you know, learning the learning the ropes, really learning the learning the the language. It's kind of it's a new language, and because uh, there are a lot of people saying to me, I don't even know what ESG means. Can you tell me what that even is? I'm like, okay, fine, I'll break that down. It's just quite long, but I think part of it's just learning the language, learning the key concepts, and being aware of the different reporting requirements and legislation, um, so that you can, you know, as you think about, uh, and and then in terms of being strategic, if you are a in the supply chain space, um, because that's the nature of your business, you're a B2B, then you can start thinking through your who you're doing business with and really working out what's important to them. Um, so, and if you have, a, if there's a tender opportunity coming up, then you can start prioritizing because because there is so much to attend to. Um, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a beast, right? I call it a beast, the ESG beast. There's so much to, to you don't want to kind of get swamped with it. So you want to have, the handlebars, the key concepts, know what it means, and then strategize according to what is important, um, perhaps to your clients, current clients, and maybe also what's important to your internal staff as well, and then start from there um, and start building out different frameworks uh, to help attend to different things because you won't be able to do everything. You just won't. Like it just won't happen. Um, and, you know, you need to do your business because, you know, you could attend to ESG and then not be in business. So you need to kind of like, <laughs> you need to kind of do things which make uh, business sense. You need to think about your capacity, your appetite, and then what's important um, for those who you're doing business with. Yeah. Awesome, mate. Love that. Uh, good right way to get started and put the plan and start. Yeah. 
biting away at it and ticking it off um, as you go. So really awesome. And yeah, a lot of great value that you've um, yeah shared with us today. And I guess as we're starting to wrap up, what one key piece of advice would you like to give to everybody watching and listening today? One key, uh, key piece of advice is to not, um, not uh, remain ignorant. <laughs> That's probably the advice. I think, I think it's start, you need to start understanding it and the very least to get a uh, handle of the concepts um this is the this is the way this is the way we this is the market we're moving into um in terms of doing business so it's no longer exceptional it's becoming normative and wherever you are in your business um you know the start the sooner you start the better um and i think even if you don't end up um uh say for example applying for a certification like B Corp, for example, the B assessment or the B Corp, so the B impact assessment tool is a great place to start in terms of um, asking, starting to ask your company questions. Um, do we have this in place? Do we have that in place? What have we got about that? Because um, it's just, a, it's a really good tool just to kind of start building out um, and making sure that you, you have a great and a really good robust governance framework um for your for your company um by all means be, be, get in contact with me uh, about my my course uh next offering uh will be in february next year um and yeah and, and that's a really good place to just get a grip of the key concepts uh reporting frameworks and the legislation and what you can what you can start with yeah also my great way to uh how we need to think about it and and move forward from there and yeah, we connected, uh, you know, Threat Networks at the MBA at UTS as well. You know, great to uh, see you on your journey as well. Uh, you know, from the various roles that you've done over the years in advertising, communication, lecturing, and uh, in faith, in board memberships that you you know you're in, as well as um, now being the founder and CEO of Unchained Solutions. Um, awesome guy, very knowledgeable in this space on modern slavery and ESG overall. And I'm sure you continue to help uh, Australian organisations to comply with the Australian Modern Slavery Act and their ESG. Um, um, targets and very grateful we connected and look forward to continue working with you so Stephen how can people find you and get in contact with you sure well if you can see the QR code um, that will take you to Linktree that will give you access to everything um, all my socials uh, website email etc um, so please do that or just google us Unchained Solutions uh, you'll find us pretty easy um, do that way and you know i'm on everything linkedin uh, facebook twitter and instagram i'm not on tiktok it's sort of just not within my realm of uh <laughs> mindset uh but uh you can find me on all the socials um as well yeah awesome definitely check out Stephen. linktree got all the links the website um all the socials and stuff as well um and yeah want to learn more about all this space and, and then how you can implement it uh into your business um and yeah been awesome and it's been a pleasure interviewing you as well Stephen. thanks Ethan. it's been a pleasure i always love talking about it could talk about it all day so thank you for your questions great questions today and uh yeah look forward to seeing where where this all with this lands where it goes thank you everyone for watching and listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth and please like subscribe and leave us a five-star review you can find me on linkedin facebook instagram and youtube as Ethan cassiotis or visit my website ethancassiotis.com if you want to grow and scale your business you can reach out to me on any platform to see if we're a good fit i completely agree with you or do i the only way you know is if you tune in next time so until next time remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear so remember to design your growth and results